I have approved the recording. I will make sure to edit that out before we start the show. <laughs> Why this... would you do that? I approved this message. <laughs> okay, the sentiment approved by Douglas Davison. This message approved by Douglas Davison. It's the self Melon uh, episode 67. <laughs> Yes. Uh, strangely enough, when I changed shirts after coming back from my parents' place, I changed out of my cinnamon shirt <laughs> and then put on a different shirt. <laughs> but I'm tired of ripping that shit. That show sucks. Let's go record an episode. <laughs> it's I, one of your trusty Stuart Seed, joined as always by the wonderful Mr. Douglas Davidson. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, I'm living. I'm living. I'm not living large, but I'm living. You know what? It's baby steps, man. Baby steps. (laughs) One day you'll get to live at large. And watching the toddler these days, uh, it's a lot of stumbling, falling on your face, and then being mad. Where where did that wall come from? (laughs) You won't get yourself to be mad at, kid. (laughs) (laughs) Baby steps. Uh, Yeah, man. We're we're here to talk about movies and whatnot. If this is your first time uh, listening to an episode of Cinnamon, we talk films here on this podcast. Uh, So we have a special focus too. Tonight we have a special focus, man. First time we've done one of these. Are we? we, It is not. But uh, before we get into it, I have to ask. Before we let them know, are we clear to discuss this? Is the is the? Did you say before we let them know, like they didn't just read the title of the podcast? Just saying. Okay. Pattern full. Is the pattern full? Negative Ghost Rider. Okay. The the pattern is full. Uh, (laughs) Gonna do it anyway. (laughs) Gonna do it anyways. Uh, Nice the way they snuck that into this movie twice. Uh, Yeah, but we're here to we're here to talk about some movies. Uh, What uh, we always start just joining off, man. Doug, what sir have you seen recently? I've seen quite a few things, and four of them I'm going to recommend. One is available at your fingertips right now. So quick four for you. One of them is a restoration from Aero Video. It's a restoration of One Armed Boxer by Jimmy Wang Yu, who both writes and directs. This was released by Golden Harvest after he left from uh, Shaw Brothers. Shaw Brothers. And uh, apparently, I have not seen the film he did previously, and I've, I'm going to conflate that with a different film he did that's the sequel to this, so I'm not going to name it so I don't fuck it up on recording. But it has a very similar uh, narrative structure of the film, the last film he did at <laughs> Shaw Brothers. As Bro, ninety percent of old school martial arts movies all have similar narrative structures. I, I'm not going to disagree, but this one seems, and he also directed that one, and I think had a hand in writing it, which is funny to say considering I'm talking about a one armed boxer. <laughs> but this film. As a restoration, it looks great. You'll notice details that you can tell that they were not prepared for anybody to see. It's the same kind of way that if you go and watch the 4K UHD restoration of Batman from Tim Burton, Mm -hmm. you look at Jack Nicholson's face and go, yeah, they didn't want us to be able to see that. Oh, there's where the application is and there's the makeup and that kind of stuff. Uh, This is just a 2K restoration, but it looks fantastic. And if you are looking for sort of an old school martial arts, quote unquote, superhero film, as it's often described, this is that film. It's incredibly light on story, incredibly light on story. It is oddly edited uh, where people are, are walking, having a conversation and suddenly a couple steps ahead of where they just were like that sort of weird editing. And if you really, really, really like the uh, uh, score to Shaft, you will love this movie as it cribs the majority of it. <laughs> yeah. And as I think I said publicly somewhere when talking about one on Boxer, thank you, Daryl, for recommending the net. It's on Netflix right now. <laughs> it's not a Netflix documentary. It's just on Netflix. Iron Fist and Kung Fu Kicks. Because if I hadn't watched that documentary, when the score Shaft played, I would have been like, wait, what? I would have thought like, is toast burning? What is happening? Yeah, because they mentioned it in the documentary, right? They did. Apparently, it was something that often happened uh, where uh, a lot of martial arts films, either Golden Harvest or, or Shaw Brothers, would take scores from other popular films and just weave them into their movies. So that is available now uh, from Arrow Video. Recommend checking that out. Coming uh, July 3rd, special screening on the June, excuse me, not July, June 3rd, with a special screening on June 2nd from G Kids is Fortune Favors Lady Nikuko by Ayumu Watanabe. This is the same director of Children of the Sea. Uh, it is an adaptation of a novel 
and I've forgotten the author's name, so I apologize that I don't have that in front of me. This is an adorable story, and it's sort of a slice of life tale. It's a coming of age story, but not on. But when I say slice of life, it's in the we're just watching a portion of it, and the it's not that an adventure happens, even though it uses some magical realism. There's some talking animals, that type of stuff. But it's more about this relationship between a daughter and a mother who are literally nothing alike. It is a charming, charming little story uh, that I do recommend checking out. If you like other films that G Kids has put together, you will not be disappointed here. The another film that is coming out on theaters and on VOD on June 3rd is a documentary called We Are the Thousand, directed by Anita Rivaroli. Uh, Wow, my Italian wife would be so pissed at me. Uh, sure. Back in 2015, a video was put out on YouTube of 1,000 musicians playing Learn to Fly by the Foo Fighters with the intent of convincing Foo Fighters to come to their small town in Italy to perform. This documentary not only covers them doing that recording, but when the Foo Fighters come and then what happens after. Uh, it is not a perfect documentary. There are a few issues where, for example, the guy who comes up with the idea, we don't learn anything about him. We don't learn why he comes up with this concept. What we do learn, though, is about his passion, about the passion of the musicians that do show up from all over Italy to do this. And it becomes about the creation of music. It is so pure and so wonderful. It runs about 80 minutes and I cried for at least 60. Now, of course, the fact that um, Taylor Hawkins, the drummer of Foo Fighters recently passed away, certainly does add a little bit of an element to that. But um, it is just so wonderful and full of joy. It is hard not to get sucked up into it and just, 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 just give yourself over to the music as it were particularly as you see these musicians that are of different ages, different genders, different races, et cetera, and just see the sort of unified, we believe in something for the purity of it, for the art of it. It's just, it's just wonderful. Then the last thing I'll recommend is also a documentary. This one is available to you on YouTube. The story of Super Mario World directed by Norman Caruso. He's apparently known as the gaming historian. Again, this whole thing is on YouTube. It's 78 minutes. It's where I watched it. It's four parts. And it literally walks you through the history of the making of the game. And what's particularly fascinating about it is to hear how they were working on the development of the game and how they took elements of three and put it into world. But then because of the demands of the system, as well as trying to differentiate this game from previous games, the thought process that went into creating the sprite design, the, the, the thought process that went into, well, how do we use this new technology to push things? And honestly, since watching it, I've gone back to play Super Mario World, and I was reminded of why it's my favorite Super Mario game. It is just so much fun and so, well, joyous. So uh, those are my four recommendations. Story of Super Mario World, you can watch on YouTube. We are the Thousand VOD and in theaters on June 3rd. Fortune favors Lady Nakuko uh, at special screenings on June 2nd with a theatrical release on June 3rd. And then One Armed Boxer, which is available now from Aero Video. There you go. And there you go. Yeah. Uh, I watched a movie called uh, that is a heck of a name. How do you spell that? Bump, uh, bump, b o o m p o o m p b o o m. It's gonna be a while. <laughs> Don't spell check that. Uh, Top Gun, Top Gun Maverick. Oh, good lord! Directed by Joseph Kaczynski. Man, it's got all the all the people in there. Tom Cruise is up in there, of course. Jennifer Connelly in there as well. Glenn Powell, who is now my new favorite actor of all time. He then, needs to be in more things. He needs to be in all of the things. And that is currently my vote for Human Torch, if you were to want to do that for Fantastic Four, depending on what age range they go with. Um, man, this movie is fucking fun as all get out. Uh, it's better than it has any right to be. Um, I think we've seen that, especially with comedy, 
legacy sequels don't always go well. Matter of fact, there isn't a great one in comedy, but the legacy sequels don't normally go well. This one, I'm so glad Paramount kept it in the back pocket for as long as they did, because this needs to be seen on the biggest screen with the loudest speakers possible. If you can get that Dolby experience, get that Dolby experience in your life, because uh, it's bone rattling. Um, Maverick, back 30, 30 some uh, about 30 years later, uh, still just still just doing young guy shit as <laughs> as an old man. And it's kind of the kind of the, one of the themes of the movie is, you know, uh, time passing you by, um, dealing with the fact that time is passing you by and making way for, you know, the, the newer, hotter thing. And how do you deal with that? And how do you, you know, how uh, something that has defined your entire life when that is no longer an option? What are you? Who are you? Um, but is the answer uh, fly uh, U.S. Navy aircraft for a movie? The answer is like yes. Pers- is, is the answer that you and you force your co- co-stars to fly actual planes. Yes. Oh, okay. I God was bless that man for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most people get to that point in their lives and they just buy a Corvette or something, but you know, you could also... No, you, you learn to fly fire jets with IMAX cameras inside <laughs> of them, apparently. Um, you know, a lot of people are hailing this as the return of the blockbuster, which is silly because we're still getting blockbuster movies. It's the return of a practical effect blockbuster is, I think, what they mean to say. Um, or they're just you know intentionally deriding mcu movies it's it's it is a blockbuster in every aspect it is a spectacle it's got unexpected humor all throughout it's a great story we get you know goose's son is in there of course that's miles teller so that's an interesting element that's weaved throughout it and the plot is 100 and i'm not kidding here star wars a new hope that is the the overall goal of this movie is there's exciting. holograms and they have force powers. <laughs> and... <laughs> yes. Wait, Help us, Maverick. You're our only hope. Uh, <laughs> Miles Teller probably is three people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's man, it's it's my number one movie of the year right now. And I had a blast watching it in theaters. Both times I've seen it, and I, I might have one more in me. I cannot sing the praises of this movie enough. Uh, faceless enemies, Val Kilmer is great in his one scene Sweet. it's uh it's wonderful man from and tom cruise man is putting in some good acting work all throughout this movie as well um i've seen a little bit of complaining on twitter about just the arrogant nature of all the characters and i feel like a lot of people don't realize watch the first one <laughs> i mean not just that but people don't realize that that's kind of you kind of need that to be a fighter pilot uh, i've known many of those many of them in my day and like ego is just kind of something that you have to have in order to you know hurdle yourself in a multi-million dollar piece of equipment you sort of feel like you can control space time and gravity i imagine yes exactly exactly they're some of the most arrogant bastards i know uh and they've earned said arrogance Uh, so uh, it came off as in very genuine to me okay uh very good movie highly recommend i saw on the other before you do before you do Uh uh-huh because I pulled this up because I just want to make sure we talked about Star Glenn Wars. Powell. We, you know, we talked about Glenn Powell at the very start. Have Smoke. you? I didn't realize he was in the Dark Knight Rises, so I'm going to have to go back and look that up. He's a banker. See, he's what? He's a banker, I do believe. Really? Okay, so. I, I have to check that out. He has a minor role in Hidden Figures, which uh, it, he's great in. Anyway, uh, have you seen everyone? Everybody wants some. A Ring, Richard Linklater movie? No, I'm not a huge Linklater guy. Me either. This film rules. Uh, so I would recommend that. He was in Set It Up in a rom com opposite uh, Zoe Deutsch and mm-hmm. Lucy Liu. And um, God damn it. Uh, we've seen him in person. Tay Diggs. Wow. Or do a rom com that's on seen Netflix. In person. It's, it's killing me that I couldn't remember. Uh, Expendables 3. He was also in that. Uh, yeah. He's been in quite a few things. He uh, apparently was in Spy Kids 3D, which I saw in theaters. I have no recollection. Of. I feel like this is he's on the bubble right now. And I think he is like the new Florence Pugh. Like you could tell when Florence Pugh was right there on the bubble and then she exploded onto the scene. Like she was she was sizzling with uh, fighting with my family. And then whatever movie she came out with, that's what blew her. And I think we are right here with Glenn Powell. I think he might be one of the 
next big things uh trademark <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which, if I remember correctly, because Fighting with My Family was in 2019. I think Midsummer Lady, Lady was... Macbeth was 2016, and mm-hmm. she, I, I never saw it, but I kept hearing about it, and she was supposed to be great. But after Fighting with My Family, she did, in the same year, Little Women and Midsummer. Yep. So it was probably Fighting with My Family, then Midsummer came out, then Little Women around. Yeah, Fighting time. with My Family was like springish. Midsummer was like, summerish and then little women was like december if i remember correctly that so that, that was back. yeah that's the year she 2019 is the year she really went from like oh, she's pretty good to oh she's she's one of the new starlets and i'm hoping we get the same thing for glenn powell the only person to successfully outsmug tom cruise if i said on twitter and he's he's great and that's a good looking man too from from what i understand he actually interviewed for the role of of goose's son teller got it and there's been some speculation. I don't know the accuracy that that the people that were casting were like, he's too far. He's not. We don't want him for this, but we're going to give him a part. So hearing you say that he's he goes toe to toe with Cruz, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Someone was even like, why don't why don't they do another movie, but make him like uh, Maverick's unknown child of him and Charlie? Like, <laughs> Yeah, he's he is. He, he's the thing that I came out of that movie loving the most in a right movie on. where i loved everything right on uh yeah even uh, more excited now to finally see it yeah please do sir and on the opposite end of the spectrum uh memory fucking sucks in the latest liam neeson nonsense i finally wish caught. you could forget it yeah I, I wish i could forget it and that is somewhere in my review if i remember correctly uh, a movie that will not stay in yours very long, <laughs> I do believe is what I said. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, it is Liam Neeson action movie number 72. If you've seen anything past Taken 2, you've seen this movie already. Um, it's past time for him to hang this action nonsense up. We have seen him do great dramatic roles. It's time for him to get back to doing those kinds of things. Uh, this is not good based on a, uh, a hitman with early onset dementia. Um, who what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, who decides to not take a contract on a young girl, and then he gets caught up in a whole web of nonsense, and uh, you know the shit goes down. Guy Pierce is in there. Uh, Monica Bellucci sleeps through this movie as well. It's just uh, not great, and it's directed by Martin Campbell, which which is unfortunate. Like, this is the motherfucker that gave us Casino Royale and Golden Eye, if I remember correctly. Uh, Martin Campbell is is better than this, but uh, but yeah. It's it's 114 minutes too long. It's a movie that you can pass on. I'm just curious. Is it 115 minutes or is it 114 minutes? It's 114 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's a real bummer. I, I mean, I know it wasn't a big hit with a lot of people. Uh, last year, 20 was it? Yeah, 2021, Martin Campbell directed The Protégé, which was, to me, a, a fun movie. I enjoyed is it. Is that the, uh, the Mary Elizabeth Winstead movie? No, 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 no. This was um, Maggie Q, Sam Jackson, Michael oh, Keaton. Because we got three right around the same time. You got Gunpowder Milkshake, then you got the Protege, and then you got the. Uh, the yeah, I can't think of her. I actually haven't seen hers. And I- but Maggie Q uh, was fantastic as as an assassin who's out for revenge. Da, 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 da. There's there's a subplot in it that doesn't quite work. But Martin Campbell did great work in that one as the director. Anyway, not to right sidetrack. Uh, yep, no need to talk about it anymore. I also saw a Norwegian supernatural thriller called The Innocence. You hear about this? Yes. I've uh, not yeah. seen it, but I've heard good things. Yeah, I was somewhat interested. And then uh, Joel Winstead, friend of the show, he was like, man, The Innocence is wild. So I was like, okay, so I sit down and watch it. And yeah, man, that movie's all kinds of weird and fucked up and creepy. Um, it is about uh, kids. If I had to put an age to them, I'm terrible at trying to figure out little kids' age. Eight, maybe eight, nine, somewhere in there. Uh, for the most part, three of the four of them. One is a little bit older, maybe like uh, 14, maybe 30, yeah, 14, 15 ish. Um, yeah, they get superpowers. And it, the story is kind of like what happens when you give superpowers to a, a person who cannot fully grasp or comprehend or control you know, this awesome thing that's been bestowed upon them or horrible, depending, I guess, on your point of view. Yeah. Um, and and the direct reflections of how these kids handle them are directly reflected in their upbringing. 
Um, and that's kind of like the whole thing is, is the, the familial aspect and you are a product of your environment. And, you know, of course, things go off the rails. If you've seen Chronicle, you've seen The Innocents, you kind of know how this whole thing plays out and it plays out exactly how you think it plays out. But the tone that's set all throughout that is uh, definitely creepy. Of course, the kid who breaks bad uh, does a good job at just like dead eyes. There's nothing coming in there. Uh, he is appropriately creepy. Um, our main protagonist, little piece of shit girl, but she's still uh, <laughs> still interesting enough. Like the first 10 minutes, you're like, fuck this girl. Uh, but, you know, she 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 battles through. I know there was some issues online with, with that character's older sister who is uh, autistic. And I think some people had issues with how not how it was portrayed, but just how they use it as a plot device. Mm. Um, how they, how the, the actress who was not neurodivergent portrayed it was actually praised. Uh, not, not too over the top or hammy or anything like that. They, 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 they hit it in the sweet spot. They just didn't like what they did with the character. But yeah, it's, it's a dope movie. It's, it's... IFC Films, right? IFC Midnight, baby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good movie. Great cinematography in there as well. Directed by Eskil Vogt who, if I remember correctly, is known for doing a whole lot of collaborative work with uh, Joaquin Trier. Yeah, Joaquin Trier. Did a lot of stuff with him. Um, I know that name. Why do I know that name? Uh, he's a director. He, uh, I, I know you've seen some shit this dude's done. Uh, oh, oh! Did you you saw the worst person in the world, right? That's them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. They, Thank they you. They write together, it's, and this that, is his that, first project on his own. Right on. I thought the name sounded familiar. I could not for life of me. I would not have been able to place it. Yeah, in I was fact, now flipping. Uh, I'm on Letterbox, flipping it over. Writer of Worst Person in the World, and also Thelma, which I've Thelma. heard about but have not seen. Yeah, uh, haven't seen Louder Than Bombs either. I didn't realize that was him. Yeah, wasn't the biggest fan of the Worst Person in the World, but I am a pretty big fan of The Innocents. I thought it was a pretty good movie. I have seen Midnight. If you get a chance to check that out, you look for something a little bit creepy on settling. That's right up your alley. Sweet. Boom. Uh, all, right, all right, are we ready to move on to our uh, main topic for the day there, sir? Uh, I'm ready to light the fuse if you are. All right, then light that doom, fuse. Doom, 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 <laughs> doom, doom. Uh, not because we were doing this, but because people have been talking about all manner of things. I, I, Someone was revisiting Mission Impossible 2, and I was like, to me, out of all the Mission Impossible movies, that is the weakest of the film for me. And I went right. to revisit it and noticed that in the opening sequence, when we meet the bad guys and the whole stage gets set before we see Ethan Hunt hanging off of a of a of a, a giant rock structure. Yeah. It's not even a cliff. It's just like giant rock. He's free climbing. Uh, we meet our Russian who is talking to his friend Dimitri, played by Ethan Hunt. So I jumped from that after watching that opening to uh, Ghost Protocol to see what his name was, his undercover name was when he had put himself in jail. It was Sergei. I was disappointed. <laughs> well, because they th this series as a whole, particularly starting with Rogue Nation, um, Rogue Nation is when they began doing the serial stuff. Okay, yeah. We're, yeah. we're end of Ghost Protocol. Hey, we've got these people and they're da-da-da. You first hear about the group, I've forgotten their name, that we then meet in, in Rogue Nation, which then Fallout is now, okay, everything Ethan Hunt has done, we're going to we're gonna reference all that shit. I can't fucking wait for Dead Reckoning. Yeah, the only problem I have with those damn titles is they're so fucking vague and opaque. I don't know which is which is which is which is which. I know one, two, three. And you start giving me fucking subtitles. I don't know which one. Rogue Nation, uh, I need three, New four. Hope, Ghost uh, The Last Jedi, mm -hmm, Rise mm -hmm. of Skywalker, mm -hmm, Phantom mm -hmm. Menace. I mean, none of those titles truly apply to <laughs> the story. The Last Jedi about. totally applies to the story. What are you She's talking not, about? She, there, the last... No, no, no. There was, there was this great... I, I don't know if it was on TikTok or on YouTube, but someone was like... They named explaining them wrong. How, explaining how the plot of the movie would be more appropriate with the following title. Yeah. It's and all just, just set up titles, set up titles, yeah, set up yeah, titles. Yeah. And like how the Phantom Menace was actually Palpatine. So that would have been a better reference for, I think... Um, Rise of Skywalker, was, maybe? Uh, Rise of Skywalker would have been A New Hope. Yeah. And yeah. something like that. And, and just... Anyway, but the whole light diffuse thing, I fucking love how they do that shit. They started working that in 
to the Mission Impossible movies to go back to the original thing, which of course brings us to our topic today, Tom fucking Cruise. Tom fucking Tom Cruise. Tom Leslie Bartholomew C- Cruise. Is that his name? His full no name? No idea. No fucking idea. <laughs> it is for this. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, I'm yeah. sure he got a permit somewhere to become a Leslie. I have no idea. <laughs> it could be a family name. No idea. It could be a family name. I um. So prepping for this joint, uh, I realized that as much as, like, as a dude, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's whatever. But uh, as a, as an actor, solid. I solid as shit. Mm-hmm. But then I realized, like, out of his whole filmography, I think I've only seen like ten Tom Cruise movies, and I've seen large portions. Of like another 15 Tom Cruise <laughs> Like I've seen like an hour and a half of The Firm, but I've never seen the whole thing. And I've seen like 45 minutes of uh, of like Days of Thunder. And I've seen like the third act of Jerry Maguire, but I have not seen the holes of a lot of his movies, Stranger. You said fuck. I want to help. <laughs> Sorry. But, but yeah, what I have seen, I almost always enjoy of this man's work. It, it was interesting as a, as a kid, because I think he's about 10 years or so my senior, maybe 20. Yeah, probably closer to 20. Um, but Top Gun and Days of Thunder, I was pretty young when, when he released those. And Days of Thunder, uh, unless it was driving, I was bored as shit. And it actually wasn't until about a year or two ago when Paramount put out a 4K release of it that I sat down and watched it beginning to end. And I went, Oh, this is way better than I thought it was as a kid. But I Pretty mean, dope. there's there's the ways in which we we engage with material differently from one age to another, and sometimes our favorite movies as kids are kind of crap when we're adults, and vice versa. So you just never know. You just never know. But I I it turns out I've seen a bunch of his films. There are some of the more recent ones that I haven't seen, like Magnolia. I I haven't seen uh, or Night and Day. <laughs> yeah, 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 pass there. on that one. Uh, we watched Vanilla Sky. Vanilla Sky? No, it wasn't Vanilla Sky. What did he do? That's a remake. Was it Vanilla Sky? For um, Reef Ride Scenes that came up, the the, the dice tossed us up. But what's the it's... what's the plot? Because I, off the top of my head, I can't think think of Vanilla Sky was an adaptation. But it's, what was the plot of the movie? I it's oh, this is years ago. It's uh it's like he's wearing the the weird mask on his face because of a facial injury. Yeah. Then it was Vanilla Sky. Vanilla Sky. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Vanilla Sky. Uh. Yep. That's it. Um. But when you look at his open list, your eyes, that was the original movie. But when you look at this, we're not even talking about the Mission Impossible movies. We're not even talking about Top Gun, but Minority Report, which a lot of people love. For some reason, I don't. Rain Man, uh, Interview with a Vampire, War of the Worlds, which for some reason I can't get into at all. I haven't seen Oblivion, but <laughs> Good <No>. Men, <laughs> The Outsiders, uh, the Jack Reacher movies, although the first one is far better than the second one. Uh, right let's see, here. Risky Business, Color of Money, which, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Born on the Fourth of July, Legend. I mean, this guy. He has been doing it in decades, man. He has been. According to Letterboxd, he's in Young Guns, and I call shenanigans on that because I don't I remember him at all. I heard of that. as like an undisclosed role, but I didn't know if that was just a uh, just a, like a I can't think of the phrase. Just like an urban legend that Tom Gun- or Tom Cruise is somewhere in, in Young Guns. Uh, I'm going to do some research on it after this because I forgot to do it beforehand. But like even Le- Edge of Tomorrow which is one of, to me anyway, the rare roles he's taken where he's not, he's the lead, but he's not a badass. He's not coming from a lead position. He's actually an asshole that gets taken down a couple of pegs. And honestly, that film is fantastic, if not only for showing off how Emily Blunt is a goddamn badass, Mm -hmm. but uh, if it weren't for the literal ending of the movie, that film to me would be perfect. And it's an adaptation of a manga, which I've never read. All you need uh, is kill. All you need is kill. Thank you. I could not remember the name of it. Uh, but I'm excited to take a look at the 4K UHD that's coming out July 5th. Soonish. Yeah. 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 All right, then let's get into it, sir. What is your first? <laughs> I'm going in chronological order because 
uh, when we came up with this list, the first one that came into my mind is my favorite one. And it just so happens to be out of these three, the most recent. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the one of my favorite Tom Cruise performances, it's also a movie that I have revisited many, many times, though, probably not in the last decade. It's the uh, Edward Zwick, The Last Samurai. In ah, OK, I I have always had an interest in Pan-Asian culture, China, Japan, uh, Taiwan, Korea. Those are Asian. Yes, so th- those in fact are. But I've, I've had an affinity for th- their films and some of the themes that that they've explored. And this was, I think, my first at least knowing interaction with Ken Watanabe, who is um, uh, at least in this film, I would describe him as legendary. Like this is the kind of film that you watch. And then when you see him in Godzilla for like that cup of coffee that he gets uh, and his death in King of the Monsters, you feel it because he is just a, a, a mountain of a performer. And uh, I really do need to revisit this film. For those of you that are unfamiliar, it's an American who's hired to instruct the Japanese army in modern warfare. He is, of course, a drunk. He has given up more or less on life. But what he ends up doing is siding with the people that the Japanese army are um, fighting against because it's sort of a modernity versus classic idealism type of story and he he is not the last samurai ken watanabe is the last samurai and he's there he he gets saved more or less by these people and it's it's really moving um i think it walks the line of the white savior but uh i don't think it becomes it but you you had a for for years i've always found a parallel between The Last Samurai and Shogun. is a dude, dude, white guy who ends up indoctrinated in Japanese culture and kind of takes on their ways, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. And I just typed into Google The Last Samurai Shogun. And, you know, Google gives you that, like, people also ask section. The first one there is The Last Samurai based on Shogun. Uh, yeah, it's always had a Shogun-esque feel. And like you, I have been meaning for years to to revisit it because uh i remember thinking ah, i was all right it's pretty good but I, I do need to give it a re-examination as well i, I have rewatched it yeah it, given the last time i had the time to rewatch a 154 minute movie i watched that movie several times uh when it released especially after it released on dvd and i still have that thing downstairs uh, i don't think i don't know if it's gotten a proper blu-ray at this point i'd probably just wait for the hopeful 4k release Ah, hopeful, hopeful. Yeah. hopeful hopeful that hopeful. is my number one that is uh, my that is my first that is your first uh my first man boom mission motherfucking impossible one the last mission impossible movie that was a decent spy flick not an action movie um i love all of the spy craft that happens in the first Mission Impossible movie. I love the fact that Jim Phelps is the bad guy because I can relate to a dude who works a job long enough and they're just like, fuck this. And that's pretty much what he was all about, man. Uh, so I understand where you're coming from, John Voight, in that matter. Uh, it's just a good, you know, we, we've had a lot of theatrical adaptations of TV shows over the years. Some hit, some miss. Uh, I think this is one of the bigger hits. This obviously a little show called Star Trek did all right on the uh, on the big screen, a um, little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, uh, and some don't quite do as well. And this was one uh, that is based off of the the concept of just uh, a, a very versatile team of people going in there and doing some spy shit uh, on Pluto TV. For those of you who who have Pluto and are wondering, they have a channel dedicated to mission impossible shows uh so just go in there and watch that and you can come in at any part of the show and it'll still be interesting and i think the movie carries that flavor throughout it as well man on the run after you know his whole team gets clapped out and he's just got to use like his wit and his instincts to figure out what the fuck is going on uh one of how many mission impossible movies are there now Six. Uh, there are a total of seven that have been released dead reckoning part one comes out next year 
So seven Mission Impossible movies, I think that makes six where there's a guy who worked there who went bad. Uh, that's what we get here in this movie. Um, not the case. Not, not the case. Not, not the case. Uh, with two, well, I guess now uh, they're doing this whole serialization thing. They kind of let that go. Well, with two, it was I think a former agent who went bad. Number yeah. three was just a bad guy weapons dealer. Billy Crudup was a part of the organization, wasn't he? He went bad. He did. Um, just. He was he was working with Philip Seymour Hoffman in three. Okay, yeah, that's that so was maybe it was just that pattern through one, two, and three, and then that's where you get all those wonky ass subtitles, and I don't remember what comes. And next. then four with Ghost Protocol is um, teammates were assassinated, so they're trying to get some information to stop a nuclear attack. That's where that's literally. Where Sawyer from Lost shows up. On that. Yeah, uh, and he gets murdered by um, by Leia yeah. Seydoux. There you go. And where literally he says, "What is it? Mission completed or something like that?" As he bangs down. That's right. On the thing. It's some like That's they go right. all in, ham fisted with that one. Uh, um, hold on, hold on. God damn it! Uh, we talked about a second goes pro Rogue Nation. That's when we learn about this group of global assets who decided that they wanted to impact the world instead of like being servants for various nations. They all band together to sort of get rid of whoever they want. Then with Fallout, we find out they've captured the leader, but they're the acolytes of their leader are still doing their thing. And that's where uh manual load arms henry cavill comes in and then now we've got dead reckoning now that you've wrapped all that up what's up (laughs) back to mission impossible one uh it is one of you wouldn't like me when i'm angry one of my favorite uh third acts in in the 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 spy genre type joint on the uh on the train i thought that's very clever how they they got a you know do this before the signal goes out and this is going on you're getting face swaps and reveal after reveal and all that good shit you know the, the explosion that lands him on the train and a helicopter propeller blade that just barely misses his eye all good shit man i love the first mission impossible it is my favorite of the mission impossible movies i agree as much as i enjoy others the first one is that that's the one that set the bar and of course, you've got Vanessa Redgrave as Max, who was just spec fucking tactical. Yeah, I think it's the first time. Was this ninety six? So I'm like fourteen. Yeah. Is the first time I saw Jean Reno in the movie before. So oh, really, yeah, I saw Leon after this movie. Wow, um, it's not before. Yeah, it, I was, was sixteen, like, probably fifteen. Fifteen. Ah, right on. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's all good. I like the spy craft of it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Wu came in there. It's like fuck your spies. Get these doves. And then, you know, it, it went from there <laughs> and it's kind of uh, morphed into something completely different. What is uh, what is your second? My second is a performance from Cruz that I would love to see more of where he is an absolute fucking bastard. OK, I've talked about this movie before uh, when they did a 4K restoration of it. It is Michael Mann's 2004 Collateral. Collateral. He is a fucking monster in this movie. And I mean that in a physical sense, but also just in what he's doing as a character. Uh, He, for those of you that are unaware, he plays a hitman who comes to town, to LA. He gets in a cab driven by Jamie Foxx, and he says, hey, if you take me for these couple of errands that I've got to do, I'll pay you X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. Jamie Foxx is a character by the name of Max, who is saving up to do his own business and this and the other. So he accepts only to find out way too late that Tom Cruise's character is in fact a hitman. Hitman. And as we learn through other things going on outside of the cab is that this would not be the first time that Cruise's character going by the name of Vincent in our film has likely done this. If there, there are, Hey, we've got these patterns of, you know, Cabby goes nuts and kills all these people. It is a beautifully shot film, beautifully paced. And with the exception of the ending that will forever annoy the shit out of me, because it goes from this 
super personal one-to-one moment into devolving into the usual action drama shit of a lot of these types of movies, it is up to that point fucking perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think I talked about it when we, when I discussed the restoration, but when Max is driving the cab and he finally decides, fuck you, Vincent, I'm taking us both out. That's the moment. I don't give a shit what happens next. I don't need to know if Max survives. I need to know that he made that fucking choice and Vincent got taken out. But from that moment forward, then it becomes a, will he survive? Will he won't survive? Will Jamie Foxx be able to save Jada Pinkett Smith, who he just so happened to have met earlier in the day, who just so happens to be Vincent's last target? Blah, 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 blah. Like it gets in this whole chase thing that while interesting and wonderfully shot, I feel like undercuts the choice that Max makes in the cab. Um, it was also, I think, a song. Uh, it's done to a song by um, Audio Slave that is just fucking wonderful anyway. So just the the music, the the shot, the decision. Fucking collateral, man. Tom, Tom please, if, you're, if you ever hear this, please do more movies like collateral. There you go. Boom. Please. Please do more movies like Collateral. I feel like there was a small time frame when Tom's like, I'm going to go for an Oscar, and it didn't happen. And now he's like, well, I'm just going to have fun for the rest of my career. Or maybe he went, you know what? Uh, People are showing up for these movies. And he's always said that he loves films. Uh, He doesn't exactly open up well. And he seems like one of those kinds of dudes that uh, the professional is always the version I'm putting forward. Mm Mm-hmm. But he does have an honest to God love of movies and making them. So maybe he's just in a point in his life where he goes, look, uh, I'm I'm not always going to be able to hang outside of a airplane. I'll do that now. And then I'll go back to these other kinds of films. Maybe, yeah, maybe Paul Newman's it up, uh, you know, when he turns like 75 and it starts coming back all cool and shit. Uh, <laughs> right on. My second movie, one you mentioned earlier, man, Edge of Tumor. I love Live Die Repeat. Movie. Live Die Repeat. Live Die Repeat. Live Die Repeat. It's, uh, it's, man, it's, it was fairly respectably ranked on the sci fi movie list. It, I uh, soon will be respectably ranked on the action movie list as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just such a, a fun movie. You said earlier, we, we get a bit of a Tom Cruise that we don't normally see. And the fact that he's just a fucking coward, man. You, the, the way they, they, they present it to us is brilliant. We get that, that smug. Uh, he's like a, like a, not a news dude. He was just in the news all the time. Uh Whatever his his desk job was before the shit went down, it's very smug, very Tom Cruise ish. And then when those cameras aren't rolling and he's in the the office with Brandon Gleason, that's when you get the real version of him, which was a fucking coward. So it kind of pulls the rug out of him. You think you're going to get your normal badass Tom Cruise flick, and you're like, oh, this dude's kind of a piece of shit, isn't it? Uh, and I like that Tom Cruise was willing to do that as well. And then you you get that. Uh, one of the, if not like the number two best Bill Paxton performance, uh, just having fucking fun uh, with this character and just chewing the scenery like it's Thanksgiving dinner every time you see him on there. Uh, and the, the, the Emily Blunt, the badass, the full metal bitch, she's amazing as well. And the, you know, the story, a little bit hand wavy, a little bit wonky, a little bit loopy, but you're more in for the ride. Than the story itself i still contend that edge of tomorrow is the best video game movie we've ever gotten and it's not even a video game movie um who that's doug lyman i think it's uh yeah, yeah one of my favorite doug lyman movies although i think he might have done swingers so that's uh that's that's in limbo uh, yeah it's just a great movie man I, I i'm hard pressed on the internet to find someone even people who don't like Tom Cruise, like, but Edge of Tomorrow is kind of fucking dope. <laughs> <laughs> it's there's something about when Cruise gets away from uh, the sort of typical characters that he plays. Like, I don't really dig War of the Worlds, but I like Cruise's performance in it. Uh, Jack Reacher, I like everything about that movie. Um, but his performance in it in particular is sort of disaffected, disassociated, doesn't really give a shit about anything. There's something about the way that he delivers the lines and handles the physicality. You believe all of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
I, I enjoy those particular aspects and that comes out well in edge of tomorrow. Cause you get the sense that rather than being the Ethan hunt, cool, capable, um, able to do the impossible, you get a performance or character like you do in edge of tomorrow, where he's sort of an asshole and has to learn how to step up. You, you sort of get to see these layers that you don't normally get to. So it's really kind of wonderful in a performance like that. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to sh- see a Tom Cruise doing his Tom Cruise-ness, it's a movie that makes you wait for it. And you got to mm-hmm. watch him level up throughout the movie to get to the badass Tom Cruise that you came to see. And I'm cool with that. Doug Lyman did do Swingers. What's your third movie, sir? All right. This one, I'm going to see if you can guess it based on the following quote. I can't. This, this was... The first film that came to mind that if I had to say that I have a favorite Tom Cruise performance, hands down, this is the movie that has it. You ready? Mm-hmm. Now, well, before we get started on this, sure. is it are we doing Tom Cruise performances or are we doing Tom Cruise movies? So those are two different things. We said Tom Cruise movies. This is a movie with Tom Cruise in it. All right. If you can say the MCU is a single movie, you were like phase four for all of a year. I think if we say Movies with Tom Cruise. This is a movie with Tom Cruise. This is listed in his biography. He makes an appearance. He makes a goddamn impression. And I will be stunned if you can't name this within like a couple of lines. You ready? Tropic Thunder. Fuck you. Fuck you. (laughs) Yeah. I I was so ready. I was so ready to read this dialogue. Specifically, I skipped over that movie. I'm like, that's not a Tom Cruise movie. But... Directed by Ben under, Stiller, less fucking Grossman. Less Grossman. This, he has a goddamn. He gets the fucking credits. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Get low, him. man. Love him in this movie, man. Oh, I just this this type of performance. Uh, hearing that not only was he interested, but he was like, "How can we change me so that people don't fully recognize it's me?" But not in a way of hide me, but in a way of how can we really go through, like, take me as far as we can. I love that he has prosthetic hands and other things to fully change him. Like, there is no ounce of of, um, ego in this performance. And I fucking love it. I mean, and you need that for the entire, to make the satire of this film work you need to have no ego. And I get the sense that you get that from the majority of the performers in there. Um, I mean, certainly the central cast, Jack Black, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Nick Nolte, Jay Burchell, Brandon T. Jackson, Steve Coogan, McConaughey. Like these guys fucking went for it. McBride, Bill Hader, they all fucking went for it. And like, brav fucking vo. But Tom Cruise goes to a place that I don't think we've seen him go in previous performances nope. and haven't yet. And I don't want him to do less Grossman in another movie. I want him to do something that pushes him the same way that this does, that makes you go, I want to like some of his best movies have been the kind that make you feel like you went on a ride, like you described with Maverick. You watch mm-hmm. Tropic Thunder and you feel like you go someplace with Les Grossman. It's not anywhere you fucking want to go <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. How long did it take you to, to realize? Me? Yeah. Oh, no. I knew immediately. Oh, you knew immediately. I knew immediately. For me, it took maybe, maybe about 45, 50 seconds. Because it was because they they do a very good job with the makeup and all you have to go on is that voice. And I'm like, I know that voice. Why can I not place that voice? And I think it's the the, take a step back and literally fuck your own face. That's when I was like, oh, it's Tom Cruise. There's there. They they did like I'm looking at I pulled up a photo as we talk about this. They they gave him a bald cap and some other stuff and, you know, facial hair and glasses but for me uh and this sort of helped me out with my customer service stuff i had a i was really good with faces i may not know someone's name but i'd be able to recognize them if they came back into the store and that has sort of carried over into cinema where i'll be watching something and i'll look at crystal and go i know that person i may not know their name 
in fact, I was having this conversation with her with some episode of something we were watching. It's like, we know her from somewhere. Why does she look familiar? Go to IMDb, da, 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 da. I saw him show up and I started laughing my ass off. I was like, that's fucking Tom Cruise. <laughs> I didn't realize it was prosthetics at the time until you go back and really watch it and you start to realize he's using a regular phone, but it looks like, you know. It's like a little a, tiny phone, is, phone, baby phone. Uh, uh, it's a baby phone. <laughs> no, he's got a huge fucking hand. Yeah, I think uh, a hand and forearms. Are well yes. Are all, yeah. Oh, they made him like just beefy, huge, intimidating. So it wasn't just, and I loved that about the performance because i mean yeah he's a short guy and apparent rumors abound about his insecurity about that um but when you've got an asshole studio head like this if he was a small dude like an ethan hunt shaped guy spouting all this stuff he'd just be some asshole but the way that they designed less He's there's a some, fucking monster. Yeah, there's some intimidation he, to it. He will. He has the kind of physique and hands that if like uh, the it log just, in the log in Age of Ultron when Steve Rogers just rips it in half. Yeah, that's what Les could do. <laughs> yeah, if, if that guy, if Les Grossman's punched you, you feel you got hit with a mallet. You're done. You're just yeah. You're, you're done. And then the the cutting back to him in the credits with him dancing is just absolutely nonsense. And I loved every bit of that performance. I agree. I agree. And that's why it was my immediate first thought and why it's probably my favorite Tom Cruise performance. Excellent. Here. Excellent. Mine uh, is a little movie called bum, 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 da, 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 bum, bum, bum. It's Top Gun Maverick. Uh, <laughs> so you, you just mentioned um, his height and that is something that uh, and, and more people on Twitter I've seen are starting to notice it now. They let it go. He's not on no lifts. He's not on boxes. There are multiple shots where he is just blatantly, obviously shorter than every other actor in the room. And I'm so glad they just went with it. Like he pretty much everyone just dwarfs over him in this movie because he's a tiny little fella. <laughs> so he's a, a little pocket sized actor. And, and he, he spent the last 20 years finding various ways to hide that. And he just unabashedly just let it go. Awesome, let it go, and I I loved seeing that. It's another, it's another little unraveling there uh, of the layers of, of of Pete Mitchell. And like I said earlier in the episode, man, just a man fighting against time. And what do you do if you have a young person's spirit in an old person's, not an old person, a person who was aging, in in you know in their body? Like how far can you push yourself? What limits? You know how do you do do you pass your gifts on as you can to the next generation of people. It's kind of all those types of things. Um, and it's just, just all uh, good heart, all wrapped in just exciting as fuck story with great cinematography, man. I, uh, it's, it's going to take, it's going to be hard pressed to see what topples that from the top of my list for the year, because I went in expecting to have a fun time. I was cautious about everyone saying it was so good and boy, were they all right. I mean, there's 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 something strange when uh, not strange, but there's certainly some recency bias when people go to early screenings, whether it's the premiere or whatever else. Uh, you certainly don't hear a lot of negative stuff to come out of those. But so consistently, our market was one of the last markets to get a first screening. In fact, a lot of times there were other markets that had multiple screenings. So people were seeing it more than once. I, uh, New York and LA probably were most likely the ones with those. I, I forget which. Our screening was Sean O'Connell's second time seeing the movie. Yeah, well, he went to the premiere. Oh, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, if I remember correctly, um, in fact, I think I've seen video of it. He taught, yes, yes, I did just the other day because I scheduled it on the NCFCA's Facebook page. The interview, uh, uh, the director went to Real Blend, the podcast. Ah. Uh, but, and so on unless I'm misremembering and conflating the gentleman, but Jake Hamilton spoke with the director and apparently the director is a fan of real blend the podcast, because when he takes his son to do stuff, his son listens to the podcast. So he's become a fan himself of real blend. Ah, okay. So I, I, I legitimately at this moment, I'm not sure if I'm conflating the real blend guys with Sean having gone to the premiere, but I feel like Sean went and did that, but I may be wrong. 
or maybe he just saw it in advance because he was going to be doing the podcast, yeah. which may have been recorded uh, before our screening. Uh, Sean's on a different level than most of us. So, I mean, that that he has interviewed Tom Cruise in person. Yeah. <laughs> I think for Fallout, he was in Paris. So that's that's a different level of stuff. But yeah, there are plenty of folks that saw it multiple times. And getting back to that point, so many were saying positive things that you were starting to begin to be like, maybe it actually is good. Maybe it's not just recency bias. Maybe it, maybe it is super fucking good. And that's everything I've heard. I really have not seen any complaints whatsoever about it. Yeah. Great, man. There, there's a, a fighter that pulls a, a maneuver in the third act. And I was like, no, no airplanes can't do that. What? It was just so filthy to see. No, and, no uh, they, they can, uh, they can totally do that. Oh, how do you? Well, I have a pair Polaroid. Where were you? Right above them. Right above them. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm quoting the first movie because I haven't seen that. For a while. Uh, yeah, they, they 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 do revisit that as well. Uh, it's it's just so good, man. So good. Uh, great practical effects, like I said earlier. Great cinematography. You know, I was reading how they put the cameras inside of the cockpits, and then they had to teach the actors to pretty much be their own. Cinematographer. cinematographer slash director mm-hmm. this is where the camera are so this is kind of how you will need to think about how you move your head and what you want to do to you know to get these shots so it just this the thought process that went into it was was amazing and i i need an extensive behind the scenes when that uh, when that movie hits home video yeah i'm i'm already planning to have to work something out with crystal to make sure that instead of watching it at night i can watch it during the day so that I don't have to worry about volume. Yes, I, was thinking, I don't. I don't about I don't that know. when I uh, when I saw the movie, and I was like, when I watch this at home, it will be a windows rattling movie. Like kind of like yeah. the way I did with the car chase and the Batman. <laughs> Immediately went to that scene and just let my floor rumble the whole time. We we had to have the volume down for the Batman when I showed it to Crystal because whether it was a coincidence or not, every time something would like happen in it, and the music and everything would pick up. Preston would wake up on the other side of the wall. So we had to turn the volume uh, down. Yeah. Thankfully, it wasn't my first time watching it, but I looked over at Crystal at the end of it and I was like, I'm sorry, it was so quiet. You didn't get the, <laughs> the music is part of this. But by the way, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, Joseph Kaczynski, in addition to directing Oblivion and yes. the Brave, uh, and he has a new movie coming up called Spiderhead. Buck, with yes. Teller, with with Teller and uh, Hemsworth, who Hemsworth. which I haven't even seen the trailer for this yet. That trailer was wild. But he directed Tron Legacy, y'all. Tron Legacy, yep. So uh, knowing that he directed Tron Legacy, I was already in because I love Tron Legacy, just yeah, top to bottom. That's that's what I was like. I was like, oh, they're doing another Top Gun movie. I guess O Kaczynski's doing it. Then yes, I am in Oblivion. Um, is the only movie of his that I've seen that that is a bag of ass, but. <laughs> He also had a thing. He, he, he also brought in McQuarrie for his Mission Impossible buddy for this movie as well. So it was just a delicious soup of a dude who n- knows how to write a good story, a dude who knows how to shoot a good movie, mm-hmm. and one of our best action movie stars, one of our best act- actors that we got. It was just a, a great blending of things coming together. Mm-hmm. Not gonna argue. Those are our lists. Boom. Um, so to get into the challenges, I'm going to go first because between ours, mine was the most action-y of the two. Okay. So at least it's a smoother transition. Okay. For our challenges this week, you challenged me to watch the Clint Eastwood action-packed movie, The Mule from 2018, <laughs> directed by Clint Eastwood, starring Clint Eastwood. It also has, honestly, a really good cast, uh, Bradley Cooper, Lawrence Fishburne, Michael Pena, uh, Diane Weist, Andy Garcia, and uh, what's uh, yeah, there she is, uh, Taiza Farmiga. And one thing that I found surprising, he's barely in there. Uh, Clifton Collins Jr. Clifton was in Collins there. Jr. Every movie, I love him. Forty percent better with Clifton Collins Jr. in it. It's it's uh, La Raza. I fucking love La Raza. <laughs> <laughs> Ding dong, motherfuckers. Anyway, wrong movie. Name name a bad a bad performance that dude's put in, man. He's, I haven't seen one. If it's a shitty movie, it's still like oh, well, at least Clifton Collins is in this. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. I think the first movie I ever saw him in was One Eight Seven, and even that was like, holy shit, what a performance. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, and he's going up against Samuel Jackson in that one. But <laughs> with the 
with the mule, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it centers on a man, Earl Stone. He's in his 80s. His, his flower business has gone out of business thanks to the internet. He's estranged from his family because he always put his work first. And because he sort of needs to take care of a few things, he accidentally sort of stumbles uh, because he his he goes to a graduation party for his granddaughter and one of the graduation parties or no wedding it was a wedding party that's yeah. what it was because yeah. one the guest or boyfriend of one of the bridesmaids was like hey old man uh, want to run drugs and he was like okay and so he <laughs> does it this one time. And uh, that's I, I always forget that other actor's name. He when he shows up, he's got all the tattoos. He is a phenomenal actor as well. He's shown up in a ton of shit. and I can't think of his name all of a sudden. And I apologize to everybody that I have to describe him that way. But whenever he shows up, you know, strange shit's going to go down. And he is a fucking badass in this movie, even just for the few scenes he's in. But anyway, so it's about Earl going on these runs. And. Then you've got Bradley Cooper as an FBI agent, DEA agent, who's trying to track him down. And so there's all this really neat stuff that's going on back and forth. It's actually a really interesting and well put together movie. It is a it does have some solid performances. It's one of the best recent performances from Clint Eastwood that I have seen. I did not like his last movie very, very well, um, very much. Excuse me. But I thought this story was interesting. I thought the ideas that they were exploring of the racial profiling and the way that the FBI does its business, the fact that you get a whole scene of Bradley Cooper and Michael Pena going and walk, looking at all the trucks that they know it's that model. And then they go, no, it's not this and it's not that. But then they pull a guy over and that dude's literally shitting bricks. Officer, here's what I'm doing. I am scared for my life. This is most likely how I'm going to die. Like mm -hmm. he's telling them this. So it's this wonderful little moment amongst all these rest of these things. And Andy Garcia, who plays the the leader of the of the drug organization, is just fucking charming as all get out. Uh, it fucking devastated me when he died, when he got killed by Clifton Jones Jr. And it's because of this that the ending of the movie bothers me because the movie ends and it ends in sort of a happy way. But if Clifton Jones Jr. is running things and the way that he's running things, Earl doesn't have long. doesn't matter that he went to jail. He doesn't have long. But that's not the feeling of the movie. The internal logic of the movie suggests Earl is going to die. Yep. But that's not what the film suggests at all. And so to me, there's a, there's a discrepancy between the, in, the internal logic of the film and the story that's being told. But I still found the, the journey along the way to be interesting and worthwhile. I watched it on HBO Max. If anyone's interested, it's also available on home video. You can buy it on digital, that sort of stuff. But watching it as part of my HBO Max subscription, worth it. I think it's an okay movie. Yeah. I think it's an okay movie with one great ass scene. And it's, if I'm remembering this correctly, it's, Clint and Bradley Cooper and what amounts to a Waffle House. Yes. That whole scene that was great. is amazingly done. Um, more Bradley Cooper, please. Uh, yeah. And you gave me Swiss Army Man. Yeah, did. Um, Paul Dana. How far did you get? Radcliffe. Um, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. I got, uh, I got all the way through the movie, man. Sweet. Um, it currently sits at number nine overall on my A24 list. It uh, pretty fucking good is <laughs> what I will say about this movie. Uh, it, it seems like it's 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 directed by the Daniels, if, if mm -hmm. that name is familiar. It's because they're enjoying their hottest success right now and everything everywhere all at once. Um, on home this, video, July fifth. On home video, July fifth. I do believe that this is the second movie they've done after Swiss Army Man. Um, I think there might be one of between. I can't remember. Uh, it seems like they're trying to tell you two main things. So for those of you who don't know, a man is stranded on a beach, about to kill himself, uh, about to hang himself. Body washes up on shore, and he's like, what the fuck is that? 
uh, it takes a step off to go investigate and forgets that he's in the middle of trying to hang himself. <laughs> uh, but fortunately for him, the rope breaks and he goes and it is the washed up body of Harry Potter. <laughs> Got a wand and everything. Wand and oh, everything. he's not the boy who lived. Uh, washed up body of Daniel Radcliffe and um, extreme flatulence, a lot of gashy shit going on there inside his stomach. And he, the thing you have to know going into this movie that is it is an absurdist comedy. Yeah. It's not meant to be taken seriously. No. Uh, they're having fun with the story. Yes. And he rides Daniel Radcliffe's body. It's flatulent fart written body like a raft off of uh, almost like a jet ski there we go not a raft <laughs> not a raft a jet ski using the farts to propel him across the water until he gets to a larger body of water trying to make his way back home um and throughout the trip things start happening and uh and, and he's able to you paul dano is hank and Dana Radcliffe is Manny, and Hank is able to use Manny's body in a various amount of ways to help him live and survive throughout this trek home. Hence the phrase Swiss Army Man. He's a mm-hmm. multifunctional corpse. Uh, it feels like in that story, the Danos are trying to tell us two things. One, and the main thing I think they're trying to tell us is do what makes you happy. Mm. And the second one is there's nothing gross about bodily functions. It's things we all do. Learn to love and appreciate your body, I think, is also a uh, a more subtle theme that's threaded all throughout this. Uh, for as funny as it is, it is also just incredibly bleak and dark and depressing. And in the Hank's parentage, his upbringing has not been one that is very positive, and that has had all sorts of negative reinforcements on 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 his psyche and his self-confidence and his self-worth um it's just an amazing movie all throughout only 97 minutes it's a quick watch but it is engrossing it is hilarious it is beautiful it's thought-provoking uh it was an absolute wonderful gem of a movie pop popcorn pop popcorn popcorn. (laughs) yeah it's uh and and are we falling in love there's there's some the, the some score and soundtrack is great. Wonkiness in the ending there that I don't think I quite understood. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if I just didn't get it or it wasn't explained well or we're not supposed to get it. It's it's very esoteric. I'm not entirely sure I understand it as well because it's sort of awkward and like, is it real? Is it not real? Has it all been in his head? But then they all stand there and are like, what the fuck did we just see? So I have no idea. But yeah, I was on the, this was all just a mental construct to help him deal and survive. I was on that train for the majority of the movie until that very end. And I'm like, well, nope, can't be that. So yeah, just the overall interesting. I see why people talked about this movie when it first came out. Um, it's amazing. It's wonderful. Go check out Swiss Army Man. Uh, if you have the Showtime add-on to Hulu, you can check it out there. And it is also available on home video. If you liked everything everywhere all at once, I can almost guarantee that you will also enjoy Swiss Army Man. It is. It's got a certain a, a a a. You have to have a I think a certain sense of humor in order to fully appreciate it. But even if you don't, there's still other things that's worthwhile. And uh, before we before we close out the show, I want to make sure that I get this right because he is a phenomenal actor, Robert Lasardo. Robert Lazardo, he was he played Emilio in The Mule. He's one of the guys that Earl brings the truck to initially to get drugs in. He's done a bunch of different stuff. But if you've ever seen Death Race, he has one of my favorite on-screen deaths because he's standing out in the middle of it. It's like, you can't fucking kill me. And the car just slams right into yeah. it. So anyway, yeah, Robert Lazardo. He, he's a face that as soon as you see him on screen, you're just like, ooh, shit. <laughs> All right, and that is it for this episode, episode 67 of The Cinnamon. We will yeah. be, we'll be back, hopefully, in a couple of weeks' time. And just keep this train on or rolling. Chugga, uh, chugga. Yep, right on rolling like Lennon. So until then, uh, you all take it easy and have a good one out there. Later.